the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. He received his Bachelor of Arts from the University of Pennsylvania, his medical doctorate from the University of Vermont, and his Master of Public Health from the University of Colorado. He completed his training in pediatrics and adolescent medicine, pretty relevant for this topic, um, at the University of Colorado, and he's led an accomplished career as a health executive. He's led a number of agencies and organizations and clinic systems across the state of Colorado. He was appointed by the governor of Colorado to assume the position of the head of the Department of Public Health for the state in 2013, and you might recall that recreational cannabis was legalized the very next year. So since that time, Dr. Wolk has led all public health efforts around all things cannabis, and we're really lucky to have him here with us today to share his insights and any lessons learned that we can use here in California. Welcome, Dr. Wolk. Well, good morning, everybody. Nice to see you. How many people are in favor of marijuana? It's legal now. <laughs> the sheriff's looking that way, so it's okay. <laughs> I just thought I'd sort of spice things up to get things started. Um, thank you so much uh, for having me here. It was, uh, uh, for me, a beautiful drive. I came up um, from Santa Barbara this morning, and um, when I moved to Colorado um, a while ago, uh, I used to say I never want to take for granted uh, just the, the beautiful state that we live in. And uh, I think you all can uh, say the same thing. Never take for granted uh, the beautiful state that you live in because it really is beautiful. So we are going to get started uh, right away uh, by uh, getting an instruction. And that instruction is the same instruction I gave myself when I started in my position, uh, which is that we all have to park our biases. Uh, I, I grew up uh, in an era where we were just told that marijuana is bad. Uh, when I was uh, in medical school and training to be a doctor and a pediatrician, you know, we tell our patients and our patients' parents, and then we as parents tell our own kids, uh, marijuana is bad. You shouldn't use marijuana. Uh, and we had some rationale and, and some reasoning for that. But then, uh, as we heard, um, now that the people of the state of California, like the people of the state of Colorado and other places, have said this is now legalized, um, we kind of have to park a lot of those biases or all of those biases and start to think objectively. And, and let's look at data and, and let's open our minds. And some things are not going to be so great. Uh, some things uh, are going to be uh, better than we thought. Some things may be a little worse. But uh, the important part is to stay true to the data, to stay true to objectivity, and really try uh, to park those biases. Um, I didn't know the media was going to be here today. I tend to use a little bit of humor in my presentation. So, um, but that, that's just, you know, when you have something new, especially as a doctor, somebody now uh, in this role of public health, uh, what a great opportunity to sort of start with something right in its nascent stage, right, right at the beginning, and really try and figure out all of these challenges that, that you all are already starting to figure out and figuring out how to deal with them. Um, so my other disclaimer is apparently uh, my computer is not connected to the screens. So if I start going off on a slide off my computer and you don't see that slide up on the screen, somebody just yell at me or shout at me and say uh, flip it because I have to walk and chew gum at the same time and, and hope that it works. So for the supervisors and the elected officials, I figured I'd start with taxes and tax revenue. <laughs> <laughs> Let's open this up on the right foot, okay? <laughs> uh, you know, right or wrong, uh, one of the benefits of legalizing uh, marijuana uh, is uh, the potential uh, to collect tax, uh, tax revenue. And, and one of the myths uh, that uh, you'll hear is that, you know, well, the, the taxes in Colorado generated from uh, marijuana are really driving the state's economy, or they've really rescued the state when it comes uh, to um, uh, revenue. And, you know, uh, 200 plus million dollars in tax revenue is, is no small amount. Uh, for those who don't know, Colorado's total population is about five and a half million people, uh, and our annual state budget is about $30 billion. So yes, $200 million is a lot of money, 
but it's less than 1% of the tax basis or the revenue basis on which our state budget is built. So marijuana tax revenue is not driving the state budget. It is not bailing the state out in any way, shape, or form. And I can ask the supervisors this question. I mean, what happens when you have a new source of tax revenue? Everybody wants a piece of it, right? <laughs> so. Um, this is intended to be busy so that you can't see all of the things, but um, you know, if you, if you want to focus in on it, um, you can. Um, the first $40 billion goes to school construction and then what's left over or anything additional then goes into the schools uh, to help fund um, some additional services, which I'll talk about through the schools. Um, excise taxes are not just uh, at the state level, but they're at the county level and the municipal level. And that's all these circles up here. And um, they all add up to uh, oh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 28 to 35 uh, percent that gets tacked on to the recreational marijuana. Now, um, uh, one point to keep in mind, I'll come back to this all the way at the very end, is our medical marijuana is not subjected to these excise taxes. And so when people thought that as a result of legalizing recreational or retail marijuana, the medical program would go away, they failed to realize the impact of a 30% discount when you're going to the store. So uh, there's an incentive to keep on the medical marijuana program, which is to get a 30% discount uh, on the product. Um, the last thing I'll say about this slide is, you know, um, because marijuana is illegal at the federal level, we had very little in the way of marijuana specific um, services. Um, from a public health standpoint, doing surveillance, and you're going to see some examples of how we do our surveillance, how we do our education, how we fund research, all of that as a result of generating some tax revenue to fund that. Uh, law enforcement uh, actually um, needs um, uh, support uh, with regard to some of the gray and black market issues, which we'll talk about. Department of Revenue when it comes to licensing these entities and providing oversight. Department of Human Services so that we can look at treating because potentially we have more people now who need treatment for marijuana and marijuana related addiction, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, uh, highway safety uh, when it comes to DUI enforcement. and so. The list kind of goes on and on and on, not to mention then product safety. There's no FDA uh, because, again, it's illegal. So we had to create our own sort of state-specific FDA when it comes to testing products for safety, making sure that we have an approved list like you do for pesticides, how that's going to be enforced, and on and on. So uh, that tax revenue, I'm, I'm sorry, supervisors, you know, gets kind of eaten up pretty quickly, um, and there's not a lot left over to fund um, other things. There, there's some left over, and there has been some funding of some other things as a result. But again, it's not this big panacea or, or, or rescue um, for, um, uh, for uh, the economy maybe going in, in the wrong direction. So, when we legalized marijuana, uh, the Department of Public Health actually was able to get a, a, a legislatively mandated committee, um, and it's an advisory committee that's responsible for helping us to monitor the health concerns related to marijuana since legalization. And so um, if any of you are interested and can't sleep tonight, it's a 200-page document. Um, <laughs> that you can actually go uh, to our website. You can go to our website for any of the things I'm gonna talk about today, and all you have to do is Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, otherwise known as CDPHE, uh, and all you have to do is type into Google CDPHE and marijuana, and my picture comes up. No. <laughs> um, uh, you know, you'll, you'll get all of these resources and all of this information, including this compendium, which uh, uh, I think uh, I'm very proud of our folks who did this because they took all of the existing literature and tried to make sense of it. Because you will hear, as I'm sure you've heard, uh, that marijuana ha uh, really is responsible for all the best things and all of the worst things in the world um, since uh, the be beginning of time. And so um, this is a way to have sort of a systemic objective review to say, well, you know, does marijuana really impact uh, the brain of uh, developing children or adolescents? Does marijuana really cure cancer? Uh, is marijuana okay or not okay for a woman who's pregnant? Um, and so we, we, we tried to answer all of these questions. 
Uh, and I'm going to show you an example. Um, it's not satisfying if you're a concrete thinker and you want a yes or a no. We kind of do what I call the five shades of gray, and you'll see the five shades of gray again uh, on the next slide. Um, from that, we tried to develop public health statements. So again, we come to a conclusion that says we don't recommend that marijuana be used by pregnant or lactating uh, women. Um, and then uh, we also then uh, from that develop our surveillance activities and then identify um, research gaps um, as a result. So this is an example of, uh, again, one of the 200 pages here. And so we, we take it, um, for example, in this one, this is marijuana use amongst teenagers. And I'm sorry uh, for the type being small, but we break it down so the top row going across is cognitive and academic. So uh, the question is, you know, marijuana use amongst teenagers, uh, do, are there, is there a lower high school graduation rate amongst teenagers who use marijuana? And you see substantial at the top of that column, there's substantial evidence to support that statement. So we have evidence to say that when teenagers use marijuana, they're less likely to graduate from high school. And you go across and there's moderate evidence, there's limited evidence, there's insufficient evidence, and then there's mixed. So when somebody says, even after brief abstinence, um, marijuana lowers your IQ as a teenager, well, there's insufficient evidence to support that statement. So again, we've taken all of the existing research, put it into this matrix, and try to help people. So when somebody you know, makes a statement, you either say, yeah, I think that's right, or, well, there's kind of mixed information about that, or, mm, sorry, I'm not going to let you get away with saying that. There's really not the evidence to support that. So, Enjoy that document tonight when uh, you're having trouble sleeping. Um, like I said, uh, we then used all of this to help direct our surveillance activities. And so Colorado, like California, has a lot of existing monitoring that's going on um, through your, your own public health departments. So we're already monitoring accidental poisoning when it comes to young kids. We have poison control centers and, and things like that. And so we have a number of existing sources from which we can learn what are the impacts since legalization. Very important terminology there to say since legalization and not as some people will say because of legalization. Okay, you, you won't be able to make that statement for quite some time. Um, but you can certainly say since legalization, you probably won't even be able to say as a result of legalization for quite some time. So really this is since legalization has occurred, what have we seen as it relates to overdoses in young children or getting into their parents' stuff? Is there increased use amongst youth or more accidents? Uh, are adults getting in more car accidents? Uh, or what's uh, the prevalence of contamination in products? And then again, this question about pregnancy uh, and breastfeeding. So let's get into it. Adult marijuana use. Um, the bottom line is um, there has been no increase in adult use since legalization. So Colorado adults already had high use rates. <laughs> that always gets a laugh here in California, but I'm saying in California, I think there's kind of a high use rate prior to legalization too. So, um, you know, and there's, there's a couple of ways that this question gets asked through the surveys. And this is another thing you should always ask when somebody presents you data, what's the source of the data? So we at the health department really try to hold to the highest standard and pick the single best data sources because you can find data that will support your position regardless of what that position is. So you always have to ask what's the source of that data. So for us, this comes from um, a combination of two sources. There's a national source uh, called the NUSDA, uh, which we'll talk about as it relates to youth, but that's the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. Um, and as it relates to adults, it does survey a lot of adults. As it relates to kids, not so much. Um, but then we have this survey that's called BRFSS, and it's not pronounced BARFS, it's pronounced BRFS, uh, and that's the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance Survey. A and a very strong survey when it comes, uh, because th this actually surveys tens of thousands of adults, at least in the state of Colorado. And so um, we, we ask the question, you know, 
uh, use in the past 30 days. So that's these lower prevalence numbers here uh, at the bottom. And this is the US number, and this is the Colorado number. And right about here is when legalization occurred. And you could see prior to legalization, we were already seeing an increase in trend. But here's the other thing when you're looking at data, as the data people will, will tell you, that these are the confidence intervals. You know, 10% is not 10%. And comparing 9% to 10%, somebody's going to say, aha, you increased from 9% to 10%. But the 9% could be anywhere from 7% to 11%. And the 10% can be anywhere from 8% to 12%. So really, there's no statistically significant increase as a result of that variability when you do these kind of studies. Um, same thing uh, with the have you ever used, and that's these um, um, bigger numbers here. Um, and again, um, arguably, you know, Colorado's use rate is higher than the national average. Uh, but again, since legalization, things have kind of plateaued at that highest rate. But look at these margins of error or these variabilities. Um, they overlap since way before legalization back here in 2009, 2010. So people smarter than me who are the statisticians who look at this data will come back and they'll say, there's really been no statistically significant increase in adult use of marijuana since legalization. Um, and, and this just um, restates that, that one part, which is kind of that, um, you know, the, the more recent use, the 30-day use. And then this brings in what I call here, which is our burfus. Um, and uh, the BRFIS is the most reliable data set that we have. We did not have a lot of marijuana-related questions on the BRFIS prior to legalization, but we were able to get the CDC to work with us to add um, valid questions uh, so that we can keep this a, a valid survey. And, and that's this line right here, which really shows you know, very solidly that there's been no increase, um, and no significant increase in adult use since legalization. And you always have to be careful when you do general um, statistics because you want to make sure that you're breaking things down. Uh, for those of you familiar with the uh, health equity approach, you know, just because your average is okay, it doesn't mean that you don't have populations within that average that might be, you know, affected significantly. So for example, um, young people, maybe there's been an increase in marijuana use, but older people, maybe there's been a decrease and it's sort of hidden behind the numbers. And you can see when you break it down by ages, uh, there's been no increase among 65 and older, um, no increase uh, amongst 35 to 64 year olds, no increase in my category of 26 to 34 year olds, <laughs> and, and no increase here in the 18 to 25 year olds. And, and, and so, Again, the advocates, and I'm just, it's just a lesson in, in politics, you know, the advocates will say there's actually been a decrease in use because it went from 27.5% uh, in the first year of legalization down to 25%. And we're like, uh-uh, uh-uh, you don't get to play that game. <laughs> there's been no significant increase or decrease. Those numbers are essentially the same because, again, look at these confidence intervals or, you know, the, the, the room for error. So uh, moving on then to pregnancy, um, we want to sort of get a scope. We're, we're just early on in this question. And, and the reason why this is such a, a difficult question to answer is, can you imagine designing the study where you take 100 pregnant women who come in, and the even-numbered women, they don't get marijuana while they're pregnant, and the odd-numbered women, they get marijuana while they're pregnant, and then we just look to see what happens to their babies or them as a result. I mean, that study ain't gonna happen, all right? <laughs> oh, the sheriff just went like this, thank goodness. <laughs> So, you know, you, you have to rely on a lot of different, you know, data sources and put things together and it's like, well, let's figure out the scope of this problem because some days when you pick up the newspaper, you would think that every single pregnant woman out there wants to use marijuana while they're pregnant. And that's just not the case. Um, you know, uh, about 10, 11 percent uh, of women said they were using uh, marijuana prior to pregnancy and half of them stopped using during the pregnancy um, and continued to um, not use. Oops. Um, afterward. 
Um, so, so that's this here. So it was a significant decrease in prior uh, pregnancy use um, thereafter. So it's not a huge problem, but it's still something, you know, that we um, uh, obviously have to address. The other thing is um, there's a significantly higher number of women who used marijuana uh, while pregnant who didn't know they were pregnant or had unintended pregnancies. Those that intended uh, to be pregnant, only 4% um, continued to use uh, marijuana here, whereas on the unintended side, um, you know, that's where you see um, uh, the much higher use rate. And again, the same thing. We break it down just to see if we're missing anything. And so uh, it's, it's more of an issue amongst younger women, uh, women uh, who have less uh, education, uh, and no real differences uh, uh, amongst uh, races. So uh, it's not a, a racial or ethnic uh, disparity on this one either. Um, this will be a recurring theme of mine, which is that just because you're legalizing marijuana and everybody's focused on marijuana, Let's not forget this guy, alcohol. Um, and I'm gonna show you that over and over again in the statistics, which is that you know we, we can talk about all these things as they relate to marijuana, but alcohol is still far and away uh, the most concerning from a, a, a population health or public health standpoint. And so we have twice as many women who are using alcohol um, during their pregnancy uh, than using tobacco uh, or marijuana. So we, we can't forget about this uh, when we're designing our interventions uh, or our education programs. So let's talk about kids. Um, same thing uh, in Colorado um, that uh, arguably uh, the youth use rate uh, prior to legalization uh, of marijuana is higher than uh, in uh, the country. Um, but since legalization, um, really no change uh, either in ever use or uh, regular use um, uh, amongst our youth. And again, this is based off of our data, which is called the Healthy Kids Colorado Survey. And so the next question, I know somebody is shouting from the back of the room saying, how many kids did you survey in order to get that number? Well, I'll tell you, 40,000 kids of which 17,000 were used for the basis of this survey once they matched, you know, and, and the researchers did what they needed to do. The NUSDA, that national survey um, that some of the anti-folks like to quote, they um, surveyed 300 kids across the state of Colorado. And so what's interesting though about the NUSDA is in the first year since legalization, uh, there was an increase, that NUSDA showed an increase in youth use. So they like to quote that and say there's many more kids uh, smoking as a result of legalization uh, than there were prior to legalization. But then the subsequent year, because now we have two years of data on that survey, it dropped below the baseline. But you never hear them quote that subsequent year. Um, and we just don't quote it at all because why would you refer to a study of 300 kids when you can refer to a study of 17,000? So then the, the next criticism is, well, you ask a lot of other questions than just about marijuana. Well, of course we do. You know, it's, it's a risk behavior survey. We ask about nutrition, we ask about sexual activity, we ask about bullying, we ask about all of the things that are relevant um, when we're trying to, to learn about what's going on with our youth. And so uh, I, I don't think that's a valid criticism um, either. So again, here I am with my alcohol thing. Um, right here is this top line, and although we've seen a nice decrease, uh, the use of alcohol amongst our youth is still quite a bit higher um, than marijuana. And the nice thing for us is we've continued to see a nice decline in tobacco use. And the same thing, you know, trying to break it down by grade level, people are concerned that maybe the younger kids uh, have access. And our survey did say that kids know at a younger age where uh, they can obtain marijuana. Um, so that was interesting and concerning. But again, did not see then an associated um, increase in use. The other thing that kids said is their perception of risk of marijuana has gone down. So they view marijuana as being less risky, and as an adolescent medicine guy, that, that could have two meanings. 
Uh, the one meaning is, you know, it's less risky, so it's more normal, so I'm more likely to use it. So that's concerning. On the flip side is, it's less risky, meh, you know, I, I'm a teenager, I want to do risky stuff. <laughs> I want to have sex, I want to drive fast, I want to do drugs, I want to, you know. So, uh, you know, we, we just don't know. All we know is, again, there just hasn't been this associated increased risk or increased use uh, 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 since legalization. So. Um, more to come as we, you know, continue to work through this. Um, no, no difference uh, when it comes uh, to race either as we broke it down. Um, this is the one that's concerning to us and should be to all of you from a public health standpoint is um, this um, high prevalence of smoked marijuana by kids as compared to other, um, other types. And a lot of people would think, well, you know, edibles, you know, have this appeal because of, you know, the infamous Colorado gummy bears, you know, or candy bars or whatever else. And, you know, believe it or not, they, they appear to be more appealing to adults than they do to kids. <laughs> um, and so the kids culturally are still smoking um, quite a bit more, um, for those who can't um, see the legend, this is smoked um, since um, 2011, 13, and 15, so pretty steady unchanged. This is edibles, they've actually gone down. Um, this is vaped, and we expect to see this actually start to increase, um, both on the tobacco side as well as on the marijuana side because uh, of just the diversity of products and how we're seeing um, advertisement, and again, culturally amongst kids, the acceptance of, of vaping. Um, so, uh, you know, and you'll get asked this question, we get asked this question all the time, well, isn't it better for me to smoke marijuana than it is for me to smoke tobacco? And the short answer is no, they're both bad. You know, the, the dangers of smoking um, tobacco products are not the nicotine, it's, uh, sorry to use a medical term, it's the crap that you smoke along with the nicotine. You know, it's the molds, it's the heavy metals, it's the, um, the carcinogens really that develop as a result of the smoking process. Now arguably, if you're smoking marijuana, uh, especially as an adult, you may be smoking less often. So that packier history that builds up for those who are in the clinical field um, may not be as high. Um, sorry, there I said high again. Um, <laughs> but um, I know you could do a count and you should charge me a dollar every time I say it. But, um, uh, and, and we're not to the point of, of saying, you know, that marijuana, chronic marijuana smoking leads to lung cancer, but the short-term studies show that you have the same inflammatory changes uh, that you see um, from people who smoke tobacco. So we believe that it's only going to be a matter of time before you see that long-term chronic smoking uh, of, of large amounts uh, of marijuana may in fact hold the same cancer risk long-term as, as smoking cigarettes. You may see that. I'm, I'm not saying that we've seen that or demonstrated that, but we are seeing the early stages that are consistent with that. Um, I mentioned that besides building schools, um, this has been an opportunity for us to use that tax revenue to actually put school health professionals back into schools. I don't know if California has had the same trend that we've had in Colorado, but you know every school back in the old days used to have its own school nurse and maybe a social worker and a school psychologist. And then over time, that's really sort of diminished to where many schools and entire districts don't even have school nurses. They have school paras, they have no mental health services. And so this is the place where we really have to address these kind of issues with our kids. And so it's very important for us to make sure we get school health professionals funded and back into the schools. Yes, because of marijuana legalization, but because of all of these other issues that our kids are, are facing today. So this has been kind of a nice add as a result of the tax revenue um, that we've been able to bring back. So that's my segue um, on school data. And so um, this actually comes from the Colorado Bureau of Investigation. So this is not, you know, health department data. Um, we, we pull a lot of statistics from our law enforcement partners. So CBI tracks marijuana-related offenses in Colorado schools. And so some people will say anecdotally, gosh, since legalization, we have so many more kids who are bringing marijuana to school and, you know, we have to call the officers and, uh, you know, they get suspended or they get expelled or maybe they even drop out. And so uh, we look at the data and what the data shows us is that actually since legalization in elementary and secondary schools, uh, marijuana-related offenses have decreased 
Uh, colleges and universities, they've actually increased. So it's something that, again, we're going to have to keep, keep an eye on. And so for those who say, well, then, you know, more of them are getting suspended. No, that's not the case. Um, you can see here, this is the drug suspension rate specifically here. And then this is the total suspension rate, uh, which comes <coughs> down here, all of which have been actually leveled off or decreasing since legalization, um, which is um, these last um, two years right here. Now, this is another one where you can get tripped up uh, depending on who you listen to because we have, again, some anti-legalization groups who will quote numbers instead of rates. And so we have had more kids drug suspended from school since the legalization of marijuana. But we have more people in Colorado. And so you have to take into consideration a rate and not just absolute numbers. And so when you actually look at the rate, the rates of suspension have actually decreased. Um, same with expulsions. I mean, you know, this is a trend that's been going on and maybe here in, in California as well. You know, uh, there used to be the, the zero tolerance days of the, um, just after the year 2000 and the early 2000s. And then everybody realized we have to do everything we can to try and keep kids in school and sort of do away with these zero tolerance policies. And so um, all that being said, that was a trend that was occurring long before um, legalization of marijuana, which again are these last couple of years here. And so we haven't seen a spike or an increase in expulsions um, since. And again, for those who might think, well, it's because they're dropping out, um, that's not the case either because our dropout rate continues to fall off um, since legalization as well. So not a significant issue as it relates to school offenses or um, kids being able um, to stay in school. So now I'm gonna shift um, to the healthcare system a little bit. Um, you know, we've been tracking emergency room admissions and admissions to hospitals. Um, to see if as a result of um, or since legalization, we have more folks coming in with marijuana-related illnesses. Um, and so um, you can see here, this is uh, where kind of legalization occurred. We had sort of this increase. This is the marijuana line. What's this line up here, everybody? Alcohol, alcohol right. And look at what we did. We even condensed this, the scale, but alcohol would be like, uh, yeah, <laughs> so be like way up there somewhere. Um, but you know, we had to kind of keep it on one slide. So uh, alcohol related ER admissions are still far and away the, the single biggest driver um, for these. And, and even when you look at things like um, stimulants are this line here in the middle and opiates are here this line on the bottom. You know, um, yes, uh, there's, there's a lot of news and there's a lot of concern and this number continues to go up now since um, then. But, you know, of course, everybody was focused here on uh, marijuana-related emergency visits. And you can see it's come, come down a bit, um, but it, it's a little bit of a moving target, and there's a couple of reasons why uh, we think uh, this number went up. And again, it could be concerning when you look at these absolute numbers so, um, and, and then convert them to rates. Um, because you do see this increase in hospitalizations that have marijuana coded in them, and uh, as well as emergency room visits. So here's a, a couple of um, anecdotal, yet uh, I think uh, they do have some small impact to these numbers. Number one, um, since legalization, physicians and folks uh, who work in the emergency rooms and clinics uh, are more quick and biased to ask about marijuana because they think, you know, if you're sick or you have anxiety or if there's something going on, prior to legalization, they might not necessarily ask, but now they're asking and chances are somebody might admit to it because that's the second thing. People are much more forthcoming as you all were when you raised your hand at the beginning since legalization. So, you know, in the old days, you would go to the emergency room prior to legalization and say, yeah, I don't know, I just don't feel well. I'm a little anxious and I was throwing up and you get IV fluid and they code it as, you know, a viral gastroenteritis and off you go. And the very same person comes in now since legalization and said, I bought this brownie. Um, it had THC in it. I, it made me crazy, <laughs> you know. And so then you get the same treatment and the same discharge, but now it gets more honestly coded. But the most significant driver for the emergency room uh, rate increase and, and hospital rate increase are you people. <laughs> 
okay? Uh, I know this looks like a cartoon, but this is for real, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Out-of-state zip codes, when, when we sort of took this, some, and this was actually, we, we found this a little bit by accident because somebody said, how much of this is being driven by tourists? Because we hear all these stories about people getting off the plane. We have not seen, by the way, I'm sorry for the tourist bureau people that might be here, we have not seen an increase in tourists to Colorado since legalization. We've seen an increase in use by tourists who were coming anyway, and hey, on my way to Aspen, why don't you stop at the store and let me get some treats, and you know, and then they don't really know because they're not exposed to the culture and the ads and our education campaign, and especially with the edibles, you know, which take a lot longer to take effect, you know, there's these stories where people are like, I'm gonna try that one little square of candy bar, and they chew it and they go, yeah, I don't feel anything, I gotta take another and another and another, and before you know it, they've got like 40 milligrams of THC on board, and three, four hours later, they are going bananas, and they're, you know, and then they get anxious and they get paranoid and maybe they get hungry, but you know, they're just like, you know, off to the emergency room. And um, the emergency room doctors actually are, are working on describing um, this condition. Um, and so um, anyway, uh, it's just interesting that uh, it's out of state residents uh, that are driving that. So you, you may have a little bit of the same issue. Uh, so you're just gonna have to watch out for that. Um, so here's another interesting one, which is calls to poison control center. Um, what's my top line? Alcohol. alcohol. Look at all those calls coming in for alcohol-related ingestions to the poison control center. And here's our marijuana calls down here. And here's legalization, of course, right about here. So, um, you know, again, we're a state of five and a half million people. We had, prior to legalization, about 100 calls a year uh, for marijuana-related poisoning or ingestion uh, by kids. Since legalization, it's up to about 200. So again, from a public health standpoint, I mean, this is not an epidemic, okay? This is you know, something to watch for. It's a trend, and in fact, it leveled off, but it's leveled off, and again, maybe people are being more honest because they know they're not gonna get busted for having marijuana that their kids got into. You know, maybe it's because there's more marijuana uh, at people's homes or whatever. But again, the numbers are still uh, at a level that, that we can deal with. If you're anti-marijuana, and again, you'll see some of these reports, that'll say there was a 100% increase in calls to the Poison Control Center since uh, as a result of marijuana legalization. And that's absolutely true. You go from 100 calls to 200 calls, that's a 100% increase. But again, you have to sort of peel back and, and look at the truth behind the numbers and say, okay, well, you, you got me there, but it's still, it's only about 200 calls a year, which is far, far fewer than alcohol. And oh, by the way, in this middle space here, things like uh, the Tide Pods, uh, over-the-counter medications, prescription medications, I mean, many, many other things and more things that kids get into that parents call about um, other than uh, marijuana. Um, and this just breaks apart, as you would imagine, in older kids, uh, it's an intentional exposure. So they're actually uh, intentionally going after the substance. That's this top line here. And in the bottom one, um, it's the younger kids who are involved in the unintentional um, exposures here. But you could see it was like in this first year since legalization, and now things are kind of dropping and leveling off, and we'll see if they continue to go in that direction. And um, maybe surprising, it was surprising to me, but this is not just edible related. Uh, almost half, is, uh, almost the same number of calls uh, as it relates to smokable marijuana. So we can't forget about the potential harm to kids that the smokable marijuana has. Everybody gets so focused on the gummy bears and the candies and things that look enticing to kids. And for whatever reason, that smokable marijuana looks um, equally uh, as enticing. And we've done a lot of things since legalization to really kind of shore this up. I'll talk a little bit about the public education campaign. We have child protective packaging. We now have marking. Uh, everything's demarcated into single serving sizes, which is 10 milligrams. And so a lot of work has been done on the edible side. Uh, the smokable side, we still have some work to do with regard to um, product safety. 
Okay, so um, on the human service side, you know, when folks uh, are um, committed to do, um, uh, perform uh, treatment uh, as a result of a DUI, um, this is um, our top line, which is what? Alcohol, okay, we, oh, there's marijuana, okay, and here's legalization. So we have not seen a significant increase in mandated DUI treatments um, uh, for DUIs with marijuana uh, as the primary um, drug identified. Um, and overall, I'm gonna show you that we haven't seen an increase. In fact, we've seen a decrease overall in the state in DUIs. Um, and then um, this is um, by age group uh, of our, our young kids and our young adults uh, just trying to sort of pick it apart. And um, the top line is the 18 to 20 year olds and you can see that that's continued to drop off uh, uh, even since legalization. Um, and that it's this uh, 21 and older group here that had an initial spike but has since leveled off but everything continues to kind of fall off or level off as it relates to treatment admission rate. Um, and this comes from our Department of Human Services and they're the ones that are responsible um, obviously for tracking treatment. Okay, um, uh, marijuana arrests from our, um, oops, sorry, Colorado Bureau of Investigation um, in our young people. So I showed you school offenses. Now these are just general or overall arrests. And you could see in kids here, uh, 10 to 17, they've kind of fallen off since legalization. Uh, the young adults ages, 18 to 21, uh, have fallen off as well. And then of course, uh, now that it's decriminalized and legalized, you would expect to see this significant drop in the 21 uh, and older. So no surprises, at least at the high end of that. The interesting part though about the juvenile rates is that this is one where when you do separate it out by race, you see that there's been decreases amongst Caucasian, whoop, sorry. Uh, decreases amongst um, uh, white or Caucasian kids and Hispanic and Latino kids, but there's actually been an increase uh, in African American and black youth. And so um, this gives us obviously then something to focus on and target uh, when it comes to um, uh, arrest rates uh, as a result of, of marijuana use. Uh, I mentioned overall DUI citations um, came down uh, since uh, legalization occurred. Um, this big box, what's that? Alcohol, right, that's the answer to all the questions, by the way, I don't know if you picked up on that pattern, so. <laughs> I just saw her like turn to him and go, how come everybody knows the answer to these questions? <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, still, alcohol, far and away, you know, the biggest offender when it comes um, to uh, DUI citations as well. Now the interesting part, um, and, and folks in law enforcement uh, will, will tell you this too, is that um, there's no reliable roadside test for marijuana or THC. We, we've been piloting some things in Colorado and nothing has really been sort of proven to be particularly effective. Not to mention, this will be relevant in another slide or two, that we don't have this blood level um, tied to impairment like you do with alcohol. So we have a forensic level set at five nanograms per deciliter uh, because we think that's where impairment for most people occurs. But unlike alcohol where you blow and if you blow a certain level for almost anybody, it always means impairment, it's very different for marijuana. And the other thing is if somebody's driving impaired, um, chances are they may be impaired by more than one thing. Or if they're using marijuana, maybe they were drinking or vice versa or using other things as well. So um, our, our, our safety folks, our, our state patrol and our law enforcement folks, if somebody gets pulled over uh, for a potential DUI, they get tested for alcohol first. If it's positive, they stop testing. Uh, because there's no need to test for anything else because they have the evidence uh, in order to make the case at that point. So it's very hard, and I think it'll be very hard in California too, to establish a baseline for what was our DUI rate specific to marijuana prior to legalization to then what is our DUI rate specific to marijuana since legalization? Because no, nobody's you know, gonna do this in isolation or silo either. Again, you see all these different potential substances for impairment 
and you don't see cell phones or eating in and out burger or anything like that on there as well. But I mean, you know, there's a lot of reasons why people are impaired and, and, and why they cause accidents and such. And so the important part is to really sort of, for this one, kind of come up to the big number and say, okay, since legalization, have we seen a dramatic increase in DUIs? Have we seen a dramatic increase in car accidents or fatalities? And the answer when it comes to DUIs is we haven't seen an increase, and in fact, we've seen a decrease. Now, this is another one that's a little bit tricky to interpret, okay? This here on this side are um, cannabinoid or THC uh, Delta 9 positive drivers who've been involved in fatal accidents. So the way to interpret this is prior to legalization, 47 THC positive drivers uh, caused 55 accidents uh, or uh, fatalities as, as a result of accidents. Um, since legalization, it, it's gone up quite a bit. I mean, it's 115 causing 125. And so on a percentage basis, again, that would look scary. That's a 100% increase in THC positive drivers involved in, in fatal accidents. The numbers are still relatively small, again, in a, a state of 5 million people. And here's the other thing. Um, this uh, metabolite can stay in your bloodstream for two weeks to six weeks um, after use. So this is not a good indication of impairment. So we don't know if these were people who were involved in an accident who were impaired from their marijuana or THC use uh, or not. It's definitely something we're following. It's definitely something we're tracking. We're, we're obviously concerned about the increase just in apples to apples of this blood level uh, in these drivers who are involved in these fatalities. Um, but this is not the be all and end all to say that we have more marijuana high drivers involved in deadly or lethal accidents. So be careful when somebody tries to show you this data as well because if you're anti, you're gonna say there's a 100% increase, there's more um, THC positive drivers killing other people on the roads. Um, if you're pro marijuana, you're just gonna discard all of this because you don't, it's too confusing. Um, and I, I kinda like to sort of be in the middle and say, look, it could or it couldn't, we just don't know yet. We know there's an explanation on both sides and so we're, we're not ready to call this one other than again to go back to the overall big picture and say it's not dramatic either way. Um, that's all I'm gonna say on that and we can take questions on that after. Okay, how am I doing on time? About five, 10 minutes and then we'll take some questions. 15 minutes? Oh, I'm gonna take off my coat and we'll, no, okay. Um, <laughs> So, you know, um, we're in charge at the Health Department of um, Public Education for the, the statewide public education campaign. And I told this story last night. The first public education campaign we adopted, we, uh, we, we, it was given to us as a gift from the governor's office. So of course, when you work for the governor, you accept all gifts, no matter what they look like, and say, thank you, sir. Um, and so that gift was called the Don't Be a Lab Rat campaign. And for those who aren't familiar with it, th this was the public education campaign where we would take life-size lab rat cages and drop them in the city of Denver and Boulder and Colorado Springs. And they would have signs inside of them that say, marijuana might mess up your brain, don't use it uh, unless you wanna be a lab rat. It might affect your schooling, it might um, precipitate mental health um, illness. And, you know, and it had the big like water bottle that lab rats have and stuff like that. So, um, you know, the, the conservatives loved it. Um, and, and I have to say, I was a little bit asleep at the wheel um, when I first got there and, and adopted the campaign because still in my sort of um, uh, kind of uh, subtle bias uh, was this prohibitionist attitude that we didn't really want people using marijuana, not just kids, but adults too. And so uh, the conservative radio talk show hosts would ask me to be on and they would say, this is just such a great campaign, da 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 da, da. And, and then the activists and the people who were using marijuana were like really angry because all we did was you know, continue to propagate this sort of marijuana and jail cells, even though they were lab rat cages. And worse yet, our youth were going inside the cages and doing selfies and you know, and you know. <laughs> 
uh, and social media was exploding with, you know, youth just thinking these were like the greatest places to actually do marijuana. So it's one of those life learning moments. I still have my job because again, this was a gift from the governor's office and we kind of threw it all out and we started all over again. And we realized if you want to educate people from a, a, a population health standpoint, really on anything, you have to engage with your most likely users. And we want to make sure that people are being safe. We want to make sure that they're regardless, keeping it away from kids. We want to make sure that they're uh, obeying the rules. You can't use it in public places. You can't take it across state lines. You have to keep it safely stored, things like that. So we've taken this more kind of cartoon-like approach so that we can appeal to the people who are the most likely users. Um, and we've been much more successful uh, as a result. I can tell you I get no more invitations to come to the conservative talk show host programs. But again, uh, I'll show you some data that shows that I think we're making some headway there. Um, and, and part of it is like a slide like this that shows that, you know, 8% uh, of adults um, have children uh, in the house uh, that have marijuana around. And um, not everybody stores it safely or admits to storing it safely. So only 82%. So there's this potential almost 20% of folks who had marijuana out and available um, for kids to get into. And then, like I said, too, about this smoking thing, we're as concerned about secondhand smoke with marijuana as we are with cigarettes. And so kids and family members who are exposed to secondhand smoke, um, uh, we obviously believe poses a, a potential health threat. So we want to be able to address that as well. So um, we have uh, developed uh, these campaigns. And I'm not sure where my IT friend is. Um, do, will these videos work? Can we click on that and see if it works? OK. Well, I'll talk a uh, just a little bit about, you know, so we have this overall, you know, trying to appeal to adults. And then we also uh, hone in on trusted adults, uh, like teachers and parents and, or, I'm sorry, teachers and doctors and coaches and other folks who are around kids. Because we know that if a trusted adult is involved, kids are far less likely to engage in risk behaviors, including um, the use of marijuana. So um, this takes a little money. I mean, you guys are in California, so you know how much production and marketing and things like that cost that can actually connect with people. And so, you know, pretty proud of the folks that, that helped us create these campaigns. We also have um, a, a youth-specific campaign. Um, youth did not want to hear from doctors or teachers or healthcare professionals that marijuana could affect their developing brain. It, they just don't want to hear it. Um, and so we had focus groups with them to say, well, what's going to make an impact? What, how can we sort of get our message across? And what we found out is that youth liked this message of marijuana could get in the way of what's next. So it could get in the way of me driving a car or finishing school or getting a job or having a relationship. And so, you know, you focus on that aspect of it and the research behind that rather than get too clinical uh, or too involved. Um, the sort of fourth campaign, because we have a large uh, Hispanic and Latino population, is our, our Hispanic um, education campaign, which is not a literal translation of our English-speaking campaign. Culturally, the Latino population basically said to us, look, you have to be more direct with us. We're less about kind of some of the humor and we're less about sort of some of the, the symbolism. Uh, we want more of a direct and honest campaign. And so we had to do more of a, a, a cultural shift in how we approach that population rather than just change the language. I'm getting the thumbs up, we're good to go. Let's, let's click on one and see if it works. Maybe? Oh. It's like right in the middle of it, if you just like hit the middle of it. All right, well. That's okay. Okay, that's okay. 
Uh, you can go to our website. You can go to YouTube. You can look them up. Um, they're pretty cool, like I said. Um, um, and uh, the evolution of, of our timeline is included in this. So what I wanted to point out again was when we shifted to this good to know campaign, which was this the, the lighter approach, we had 11% statistically significant increase in the knowledge of the laws uh, and increases in the perception of risk across all areas except pregnancy. And so now we're in the process of launching our, our pregnancy specific campaign besides. So it's not a one size fits all campaign. Uh, as you've heard, we have about five or six now different campaigns. And, you know, um, again, things like, like Interstate 70 for us uh, is, is a lot of traffic. And so we're trying to, you know, it's not like California traffic, I don't think, but <laughs> it's pretty bad. Um, and, you know, edibles can take up to four hours, like Interstate 70 traffic. Again, trying to get this point across to people that edibles take a long time. So I don't know if you could, if you could copy this and say, like, 101 traffic or something, I don't know. So. Um, and like I said, you know, uh, the Spanish speaking campaign is not just a literal translation, but uh, it's, a, it's a cultural shift. Uh, as I said, trusted adults, um, supportive teachers, parents who talk to their youth. Somebody asked me this question last night. Uh, it's like, what did you say to your teenager? How did you talk to your teenager uh, about marijuana? And I said, you know, you don't talk to them about marijuana, you just talk to them. You, sometimes you have to sit and watch bad TV with your teenage daughters in order to have a conversation. I could tell you more about The Bachelor from three, four years ago than I care to. But it's those kind of opportunities, again, as a trusted adult, you look for those opportunities where you can just have conversations with kids. You don't have to be overt and talk about marijuana or sex or drugs or whatever. Um, you just have to be talking with them, period. Um, family rules. Um, families that have clear family rules in place, there's a almost two times less likely use rate uh, of marijuana amongst those youth. And then parents who actually give their opinions to kids, who actually say that I don't use marijuana or I think marijuana is wrong for youth to use, whichever way you, know, you want to go with that message, um, four times less likely to use. So that's why trusted adults are so important uh, and you can't just focus completely on youth. It's a two-sided approach, youth directly as well as the adults that are involved. Um, and again, if you... Um, get bored, go to YouTube, uh, take a look at some of these ads because uh, even the trusted uh, adult TV ad, um, it's about you know how you've done a lot of things for your kids over the year and there's a dad changing a poopy diaper and somebody else, you know, um, a, a coach talking to a kid after a baseball game and then not so subtly we bring in, you know, a talk about marijuana and they have birds and bees and, and things like that. So it's a way again to sort of reinforce the adult's role in all of this and it's not just about um, appealing to the kids. And we have all kinds of material available like I said, when it comes to the kids, we do this protect what's next. We started a TEDx adventure program to reinforce that so kids could actually apply for adventures, you know, rock climbing or river rafting or things that, again, marijuana could get in the way of your participation with so that we take this very positive approach and not very clinical approach when it comes to trying to um, appeal to kids. Uh, and, and then we take it even a step further, um, and this is uh, one ad in particular I think that bears watching at some point. Um, you know, this is a young man uh, who's all nervous getting ready to go to prom, uh, and he's got his corsage in his hand, and he gets out of the car, and he walks up to the front door, and he rings the bell, and another young man opens the door, and they hug and said, ready, yeah, you look great, and then off they go to prom, and it says, don't let marijuana get in the way of what's next. And, you know, our research shows that LGBT youth are three to four times more likely to use marijuana than those youth that uh, identify as heterosexual. Some people get offended uh, when they see this ad. This ad is not for you. Um, this ad is for those kids. Um, and again, we're trying to make those connections um, so that um, uh, we're, we're appealing uh, to the right folks uh, with the right message. Um, Okay, you guys are smart, and I want to get to your questions, so I'm not going to give you the quiz. Two minutes, okay? So just a quick word about um, medical marijuana. You know, we've had medical marijuana like you have um, since the year 2000 or 2001. 
And um, like I said, a lot of people thought medical marijuana was going to go away once uh, we got legalized. Uh, but because of that tax difference, um, it hasn't gone away. The other thing for us is medical marijuana is embedded in our state's constitution because it was voted in um, by the voters. And so not because these conditions have been well researched and are, are uh, uh, the subject of peer reviewed studies in the New England Journal of Medicine, but because the voters said these are the conditions for which medical marijuana can be used uh, is why we have these conditions. And I'm sure you, you, you can see right here to the bottom, we have so many of these poor 28 year olds who have severe <laughs> debilitating pain who still managed to get on those snowboards. Um, yeah. So, you know, we, we have some issues. Um, you know, I, I, I think there are legitimate um, uh, medical marijuana patients, no question. Uh, but there's also uh, this element of illegitimacy um, that we continue to combat. And so the majority of the challenges that we face as a state when it comes to legalized marijuana are more so on the medical side than on the recreational side, believe it or not. Uh, physicians who are more about profiting from writing recommendations um, or people who grow legally, but then illegally um, send it out the back door to neighboring states. Colorado is surrounded by a bunch of states for which um, uh, marijuana is not legal. And it's, it's one of the questions and one of the things you should consider, I think, as a county, because Colorado, like California, we have local control, so each county can make a decision about whether or not they want to have shops uh, or dispensaries uh, in their counties or in their communities. But if people are just driving to the next county or community and buying it there and then just bringing it back in, um, then you're shorting yourself that tax revenue unless you feel like in your county or in your community, people really are just not going to use it, not, want, not wanting to go get that. Um, you know, but it's something that you have to consider uh, when it comes to, um, again, not seeing much in the way of public health impacts or use increases or what have you. So um, why not um, sort of put a spotlight on who's using and getting the tax revenue so you can do the surveillance, you can do the education and, and not fall prey to some of the, I'm sorry to the media, uh, but you know, some of the things that the media portrays. Um, we haven't seen an increase or a decrease, like I said, overall. Uh, one of the things we get painted with in Colorado, though, is um, this issue of uh, medical marijuana refugees, these kids who come with their families because they have complex seizure disorders and their parents are seeking Charlotte's Web, you know, this Lorenzo's oil for their child's um, seizure disorder. And so at one point you would have thought we had tens if not hundreds of thousands of kids and families moving to Colorado so that they can get access to this medication. At no point did we ever have any more than 300 total kids who were getting access um, to um, Charlotte's Web or CBD oil for their complex seizure disorders. And this is one of the things that we're funding research on too is to see if this actually you know, has some benefit um, because anecdotally, I can tell you, I've seen some kids, and I'm a pediatrician, um, who and their families have benefited from uh, those kids being able to have access um, to that CBD oil. I've also seen kids, and you never hear about these kids, who've had some pretty adverse effects um, from taking that. Um, so it works for some, it doesn't work for others, and we just have to get some more research done and, and, and try and sort of uh, get, get some conformity around this. So. I've gone over, I think, but I'm ready for some questions. Thank you all for your attention, and thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Okay, our first question is, um, what about the response of the THC levels of 70 to 90%? True or false? So talk about THC levels. That's a good question. Uh, a lot of people are concerned about potency and the increases. Um, you know, today's marijuana is not your mother's marijuana, or your father's marijuana, because um, uh, it's much more potent. And, and what that means is a higher percentage or higher milligram strength of THC. And the medical literature, um, we, we don't have um, much, if any, good research to support that higher levels of THC are worse for you or more harmful to you than low levels. So one of the studies that we're funding is actually looking at potency 
higher levels of THC, what does that do in the bloodstream? And then we have a, a, a cognitive neuroscientist from the University of Colorado who's doing cognitive testing on those patients afterward to see if there's a relationship between the THC potency, the blood level, and then cognitive functioning. And, and she even, uh, we gave her funding for this thing called the CAN van um, because uh, one of the challenges when you conduct research is because it's illegal federally, uh, a university can jeopardize their federal funding by studying state marijuana. And so um, they actually send their van to the person's home monitor their consumption of the marijuana. I know this sounds awful to some people, I'm sorry. But they go, they watch them, and they monitor their consumption of marijuana at home, get them on the van, bring them to their lab, check their lab test, and do the cognitive functioning, and then drive them back to their home. So it's sort of like an Uber-style research <laughs> thing. So. Thank you. All right, next question. Has your child welfare services handled accidental exposures of marijuana in children? Has there been significant changes in policies? Oh gosh, another great question because um, uh, I'll say like for example on this, this pregnancy issue, you know, we have folks who are trying to study uh, the use of marijuana in, in women who are pregnant. It's still reportable. So if you come in uh, and you're um, THC positive and you're pregnant, that's still reportable to human services. Uh, there has not been an increase in reports um, to uh, child services. So uh, with regard to sort of the child abuse and neglect issues, we haven't seen an increase there. But we, we do have this sort of, again, mismatch of federal reporting requirements versus state reporting requirements that makes it difficult for us, again, to conduct research. Okay, a number of questions asked about employers discriminating against hiring people who test positive for cannabis. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so it's still at the employer's discretion. Uh, the employer uh, reigns supreme uh, in making that decision, and that's been tested uh, even with the medical, uh, because people are like, well, I have a valid medical card, I have a valid medical condition, uh, I uh, have my medical marijuana uh, legitimately and legally, uh, uh doesn't matter. Um, the employer gets to decide um, if, um, one, you're impaired, two, if you're allowed to have a positive test or not. Most employers, uh, and it's similar to alcohol and prescriptive medications, you can still come by it legally, but if it interferes with your ability to perform your work or your job, that, that's at the employer's discretion. So labor law and the courts have uh, found on behalf of the employer. Obviously, education is vital to decrease use among kids. What is the psychological impacts to some adolescents with psychosis and schizophrenia? Oh, next. No. <laughs> yeah, you're going to cover that, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, one of, one of the, the valid concerns, uh, and I think you're going to hear about this uh, in Cobb's talk uh, next, uh, is uh, THC's uh, ability as a, a potent... Um, uh, psychoactive uh, chemical or component. Uh, and so um, th this is really concerning for us because people who suffer from mental health disorders, and especially kids or teenagers, um, marijuana and THC um, can, can be um, v very detrimental, v very bad um, for them. And so, um, you know, it's something that um, uh, we have to continue to work on. Uh, PTSD uh, is, uh, are you gonna talk about PTSD? No? Oh, shoot. Okay, well, I mean, PTSD is tough because you have uh, a lot of folks who serve this country who come back um, from serving who have post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, very uh, empathetic uh, to them uh, as advocates uh, for having access uh, to marijuana for their PTSD. And it's one of these things that could actually make their PTSD worse because of how psychoactive the THC is. Uh, but it's one of those things that, again, you'll hear from people that tell you um, it's been the be all and end all for them and, and save their lives. So um, it's, it's a question that's yet to be answered. Thank you. What will the negative statistics look like after marijuana has been legalized and commercialized for as long as alcohol? 
Yeah, we don't know, and that's, that's an important caveat. Uh, you know, all of the data that I showed, obviously, um, even though uh, people like to say, you know, uh, it's been five years, it really hasn't been five years. It was legalized in 2013, didn't take effect till 2014, and we really only have data for 2015 and a little bit of 16, so we only have two years of data. So the caveat is, at least in the short term, we haven't seen any significant fires from a public health and a public safety standpoint. Um, and don't forget, like uh, California, Colorado, we didn't start from zero. When people think of legalization, they think all of a sudden you're going to have this big influx of, of users and commercialization and, and, and all the things that come with it. You're starting from here. And so the question is, are you going to continue to stay here or are you going to see it go up? Because anybody who thinks that marijuana isn't a prevalent part, legalized or not, of our youth and adult cultures here, I, I think is fooling themselves. Thank you. A number of cards were asking about defining use. So you talk about the percentages of use, but is that daily, all day, once a week, once a month? So again, you saw the two lines. One is, have you ever used? Uh, and so that one gets up to uh, around 50% uh, and even higher among some of the youth. And then um, sort of the uh, what we consider a regular user is somebody who says, have uh, you used within the past 30 days? We just now are starting to ask questions. Somebody asked me this question last night about you know, um, daily use, um, potency, uh, types of use. A and it points out one of the issues again too, when you say marijuana, it's so heterogeneous. You know, in the old days when you said marijuana, it was something that you rolled into a joint and smoked, so they told me. Um, but, um, you know, nowadays you say marijuana, you could be talking about butter, you could be talking about dab, you could be talking about spaghetti sauce, you could be talking about, you know, something that you smoke or you eat or you, you know, whatever. I mean, it's so heterogeneous. And, and, and the levels are all over the place because you have um, the THC, you have CBD, you have terpenes. Um, and then each one of us absorbs it differently and reacts differently. So I could take five milligrams and be completely impaired, um, and somebody else could tolerate, you know, a, a 70 or 80 percent product and, and be perfectly functional and, and, and not have any issues of impairment at all. So it, it makes it really, really challenging. Last question. I have a number of questions here. I'm going to give these to Dr. Wolk so that he can look through them. So if you want to come talk to him during the break and ask your question, you can. But I'm getting the thumbs up that our video is working. So this is the last question. Then we'll go right to the video, and then we're having a break. How do you measure the effectiveness of educational campaigns? Oh, sorry. I was focused on the video. Um, the effectiveness of the educational campaigns is, again, to do kind of these population-based surveys. And just like anything else, that they're marketing, really. It's are you aware of the campaign? Uh, what do you remember from the campaign? And then that third level, which is really, you know, what impact has the campaign had on you? And, and, and some people will criticize and say we set the bar low because we focused on safety and obeying the law and not so much on um, the health consequences per se. Um, but it was really important for us to start somewhere so that we could start the dialogue and again, engage with the likely users first so that you gain their trust and then from there, and then we can start getting into some of the more heady um, subjects.